It's not often that you get to experience a new Mac, but there's a handful of things that I do to make the experience even better, save me time, and customize it to fit my workflow. In this video, I'll go over the 12 things that I do every time that I set up a new Mac. And number seven might surprise you. And the first thing that I do when I pull a Mac out of the box is start to install apps. And the first app that I install is Raycast. Now, I've made a whole video about Raycast. It was the app of the month a few months ago, and it does a few key things that are must-haves for my Mac. Now, disclaimer, I have the Raycast Pro subscription, so it gives me a little bit of more benefits. There's some AI built in. You can sync your settings between devices, which makes setup a lot easier, but it features a lot of things like window control that have replaced other apps that I used to use in the past, like Magnet. So Magnet used to be my window control for Mac. Raycast allows you to mirror those keyboard commands so that you know, you have that muscle memory of moving windows around, left to right, split screen, top, bottom, from Magnet or various other programs as well. And Raycast then handles the window management. With the Pro subscription, you can even do things like custom workspaces. So if you like to arrange certain windows in certain orientations throughout your Mac, you can do that and you can set hotkeys and it's easy through the Raycast interface just like everything else is with Raycast. And I briefly mentioned AI integrations. It's something I don't use all the time, but I have a few custom bots set up to do things that help me with my video editing workflow. So Final Cut Pro now has built-in transcriptions. I like to grab the transcription. I have a bot that goes and strips the timestamp from that transcription for me. So then I just have the copy of the full video transcript different from the script that I wrote, depending on what I actually say in the video. And it automatically helps me with chapters, which is something I sometimes do, sometimes don't do on YouTube. So uh, it helps to bring a little bit of stability to the process. And because it has the timestamps, it kind of knows uh, exactly where those chapters need to start and end. So that has helped me out a lot. And I use the transcript then to help me uh, come up with titles and thumbnails based on what I actually said in the video. So I often have titles and thumbnails um, brainstormed ahead of time, but until the video is kind of made and edited and cut the way that I want, I may not know what I'm actually gonna call it. And number two through five are all related to Finder because the default settings in Finder, just for whatever reason, bother me. Maybe it's some of the Windows carryover, but a feature I use all the time between devices is AirDrop. Now you can customize the toolbar at the top of every Finder window and you right click, select Customize Toolbar, and then you can add AirDrop in there. So this is an easy way to have AirDrop accessible right in the Finder window. So you have a file, it's just one click for the AirDrop button to get it you know, from your computer to your phone or your iPad, wherever it is going. And you can add a bunch of other functions in there if you want as well, like you can see on the screen now. Three is showing the drive path. So this is a long-term Windows user carryover, uh, corporate, you know, uh, corpo behavior, if you will. But I always like to see the drive path of where I am. It's helpful to know, you know, where you are. If you have way too many drives connected to your computer like I do, it makes things a lot easier. So inside of a Finder window, you go up to the View menu, and then it is called Show Path Bar. Along the same lines, number four is Showing Drive Space. So it's in the same menu view. It's right below the Path Bar. Um, showing Drive Space will give you a little bit of a description at the bottom of the window that says, you know, one terabyte used of two terabytes available, that sort of thing. This is really helpful for the internal SSDs on my computers. I only have the one terabyte spec on both my laptop and my desktop. So if I do a video project on the internal SSD instead of my external drive, you know, it can fill up pretty fast. And then I want to make sure that I know that it's getting full so I can manage that, move the files and save them appropriately. Number five is pinning things to the sidebar. This is something that should be obvious, but it took me a while to kind of figure out that you can do. So 
If you are constantly going in and out of folders, or you have a setup in iCloud Drive like I do, that's projects, areas, resources, and archives, I have all of those pinned to the sidebar, as well as some folders that I use all the time. Like I have art list assets, I have resources, I have standard things that I put in these videos from transitions, graphics, audio, and things like that. So um, you can just drag and drop folders over to the left-hand side. Then they stay there in whatever order you place them in. And then when you're done with them, you can right click and remove them from the sidebar. So I'll always pin my active video project to the sidebar. And then when I'm done, it gets you know blown away and I add my next video project there. Lastly is color code. This is something that kind of annoys me. It's a little bit of a nuisance. So I go in and tick all of the colors off. So this is under finder settings, tags, and then you can uncheck all of the tags that you don't want to show up. Now you can still use tags. They just don't show up in the sidebar this way. So in my art list folder, I have the couple intro and outro songs that I like to use. Um, tagged with a little green dot so I can identify them easily inside of that folder But I don't want all those tags to show up and clutter the sidebar I have enough clutter in the sidebar already with all of the folders and drives On to number seven, which is doc behavior. So I am a doc always on kind of guy I rarely go full screen with apps although that does hide the doc and this may cause some controversy, but uh, I also keep show suggested apps on. So on my dock, I have a bunch of apps pinned to the dock, but there are things that I don't use all the time, but I want to know if they're still open and I kind of want easy access to like, you know, shortcuts shows up there. The um, app store shows up there sometimes. Just makes it easier when you're moving between apps. I don't like keeping a bunch of stuff pinned in the um in the dock that I don't use all the time. I also don't like the magnification behavior. So by default, you hover over icons in the dock and it will magnify them to get really big. I've always had that off. I prefer the scale effect for minimizing windows rather than the genie. Scale just feels faster when you're switching between apps rapidly. And number eight is menu bar cleanup. I still use an app called Bartender to clean up the chaos that is the menu bar on Mac OS. So I don't know why almost every app you install feels the need to put something in the menu bar when 99% of people just hide it or remove it. Um, for apps that you can't remove stuff from the menu bar or that might be utilities that run in the background, Bartender is the app that I've chosen to use for the past few years. Number nine is trackpad customization. This is just like a little nit, but also carry over from old school Windows laptops. I like to have tap to click on. So as I'm tapping around, I can just tap to click rather than clicking on the trackpad itself. Sometimes that's just a little bit easier and it is a must have on the MacBook for me. I don't often use the trackpad on the desktop, but I have the same settings set up over there. 10 is something that I have learned recently is my downloads location. So you can change both in Safari and Chrome where your downloads are saved. Recently, I've made the switch over to saving all of this stuff in iCloud. That way it's accessible everywhere. By default, uh, <laughs> I had this turned on on Safari and Chrome was still saving things to my local downloads folder. So I've lined those two things up. Everything goes to downloads. This also makes cleaning up the clutter in the downloads folder a lot easier. I only have one place to go look then. Along the same lines, 11 is screenshot folder location. So I take a lot of screenshots and a lot of screen recordings, obviously, for this channel and to share on social media. Uh, but I recently purchased CleanShot X. You can do this with the default screenshot tool in Mac OS as well. But changing your location that screenshots is saved might be of interest to you. For me, I have a CleanShot folder now on my desktop. Again, that's with iCloud Drive. It's synced across all of my devices. 
again, makes the cleanup easier. I don't wanna keep these things around forever. If I do a video project or do a post, I'll delete those screenshots after a couple of weeks. Before this, I had them all saved in my movies folder when I was just using the Mac Studio desktop, but now that I have a couple of machines around that I use, it made more sense for me to try to combine these all into an iCloud Drive folder. And lastly, we made it to number 12. We'll do this rapid fire style. It is the list of must have apps that I install anytime I get a new Mac in no particular order. We've got Chrome as an extra browser. Sometimes you need a Chromium based browser versus Safari. Fantastical was my calendar of choice for a very long time that might be changing. Black Twist is a web app that I use to schedule threads posts. I need to download that and put it in the doc. I like having that there. Bear Notes I use for things like newsletters and even my podcast notes have been going in bear recently. ChatGPT has been my go-to AI tool, assistant, whatever you want to call it. I use ChatGPT a lot. Just throw random questions in there, ask it for ideas on titles and thumbnails, that sort of thing. Final Cut Pro is how I edit all of my videos. Lightroom is my preferred photo editing app of choice for raw photos taken from my Sony a7 IV. Pixelmator Pro I use for all of my thumbnails for YouTube and the podcast. Day One is still my journal app of choice. It is on all of my devices. More recently, I've been playing around with Notion. I've got a pretty good idea for a couple of things that actually would be a good fit for a database versus keeping them in Apple Notes, so I've been working on that. Readwise Reader is my Read It Later app of choice, and of course that syncs with Readwise itself, so I can highlight things in there and refer to them later in Readwise. Craft is another Notes app of choice. I don't have a lot of information in there, but occasionally I want to make you know a nice looking document and Craft is the best place to do that for me. And of course, I've already mentioned Raycast, CleanShot X, and then we'll wrap up with Clean My Mac, which is a tool that I've used. I have an affiliate link in the description down below for some of this stuff, including Clean My Mac. My favorite feature in Clean My Mac is called Space Lens, and you can dive into the different drives that are connected to your computer and it shows you what the biggest files are what's taking up the most space and when was the last time you even used this you can do things like search duplicate files and it does a bunch of other stuff too searches for malware and cleans up uh, your ram and things like that but space lens is definitely the must use feature for me on clean my mac and i have it on both of my computers now so there you go. There's my 12 tips on what I do every time I set up a new Mac. Let me know in the comments down below. Do you think I missed anything? And get subscribed for more Apple tips, productivity shortcuts, and product reviews. As always, thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next one. Later. <laughs>